Hey, look at that. Hello. Hello. Wow. Calling work Calling. fire. I go first. Oh, sorry, sir. Episode one hundred and thirty-three. I should have heard this. You now. should really consult the script. Calling Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson in London. Feeling very bad, but I am in London and calling Rick Byer in Chicago. Chicago, my yeah. kind of town. Great to be here, uh, and welcome everybody to History Happy Hour. Brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours, offering oh, all sorts of history tours in all Europe, kind of weird, weird and wacky places, and America, and yeah. and the Pacific. Check it out at stephenambrosetours.com. And whether you're watching live or watching on a replay or listening on the HHH podcast, thanks for joining us. And today. We will be talking about soldiers in the trenches in World War One and how they coped with it. So definitely check that out. Oh, and, yeah. Right? They, they, well, if they've come to watch the show, then they are going to check you it hope, out. I'm hoping you're going to check it out, right? I'm yeah. hoping you're not just That's watching cool. to hear, see us, uh, uh, you know, have fun at the beginning and then leave us. So I don't, I don't expect <laughs> that to be happening. No. I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain that people come to watch the guests and you think they come for the guests and not for us what a safe bet on that one what has uh, let us know you're here guys and uh we as you're doing so we also want to thank everybody uh who has supports us via patreon and uh we should pop up our top shelf sponsors we especially appreciate them and you guys um uh, i actually think that uh there's room for more so you know always feel free to add in as a top shelf sponsor at patreon.com slash history happy Hour. Yes. Chris, who's out there? Anybody? Any, anybody yeah. watching? I mean, yeah. for, for Pete and Gary, is they're getting yeah. ready? Can well, we? Ken's watching from Kansas. Uh, Lizzie Borden from London. Susan Yu. Uh, Stephen Esty. Uh, Owen Moody from uh, Barnard Castle in the UK. So welcome. Wally I, joining us. And uh, yeah. I see Kathy Hurst and Susan Yu and uh, Jean Templin and. Uh, and all sorts, Frank Cook, all sorts of other people. So it's good to have them all here. And if you're joining us for the first time, also really good to have you here. Please uh, let us know and say hi. Uh, Chris, is that enough Falderall that we can actually get on now with the content of the show? Yes, Falderall is done. All All right. bar is open the bar is open what is Um, on tap yeah well i'm really excited to finally get the the band the whole band back together uh we're going to be joined this week by peter hart uh and his co-author gary bain and uh peter's been on the show a couple times to talk about uh two of his previous books but uh, the reason i'm happy to have them both together is uh pete and gary are co-hosts together of my favorite podcast uh, next to history happy hour of course uh (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's due with uh pete and gary and we'll put links up to that that's uh the podcast that sort of got me through lockdown and i've continued to listen to it and enjoy it immensely and in their spare time when they're not doing this podcast they've been working on a new book uh together how come called... we're not working on a book in our spare time when we're not doing the podcast because we're lazy okay all right Clear that up for you? Okay. Yeah. But uh, they've just come out with Laugh or Cry, the British soldier on the Western Front, uh, which is a really interesting account of, um, takes a close look at British and Commonwealth soldiers on the Western Front and some of the ways that, uh, uh, what they did to get through the experience. It's not a chronological history. It's more of a kind of a deep dive into the lives of these men and what they did to cope. So Pete and Gary, welcome. Well, Pete, welcome back. Gary, welcome for the hour. <laughs> already. <laughs> Gary's into it. See? Right. You said cocktails. <laughs> you did bring I, cocktails, didn't you? Chris, right. do you have a cocktail? I you... do. I have, a, <clears throat> I have a gin and tonic. Oh, Pete, what do you got? Uh, I'm advertising again. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, All God, right. I got hundreds of pounds in sponsorship after the last one. I'm sure wow. you did. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. I'm doing a, I'm doing a Guinness. So oh, okay. Marilyn says it's you know, it really isn't appropriate because it's Irish and not British. So I'm Well I'm, but, but well we won't get into all that. I'm out there, I'm screwed. And Gary, and, and you have <laughs> uh, Gary well, I you had a really big uh, bottle. Or here's a word from our sponsors. <laughs> uh, but, but the Scotch. Oh good. It was a full Kill. bottle while I was waiting. <laughs> so he's so excited. Um, 
Well, you're kind of getting down to things, and, I, and all, all kidding aside, one of the things that I really enjoyed about this book is it looks at the experience of the British soldier or the British Commonwealth soldier, uh, and it sort of kind of turns some of our notions or what people's perceptions of what that war was like uh, on their heads, but using the words of, of the men who were there uh, to kind of kind of take issue with some of those things. But um, you say right at the beginning, you say that human beings are complicated and there is no set pattern as to how they react to the outrageous stresses of war. Yet there are common traits that we can explore. And of these, one of the most interesting is the use of humor as armor against the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. So maybe kind of as a lead in, you could tell me, tell us why humor and why it's so important. And I know you have lots of quotes. So if there are quotes from the men who can illustrate I, that. I, I think it's it's just that the, the war was so terrible, the trenches, the the, the risk of imminent death, uh, and and th there is there's a picture that uh, that the, the Tommies are sort of unfeeling brutes and they're sort of ground down, all their finer feelings are battered out of them. They blaspheme crudely. They do actually, but <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're a bit like Gary. They're dependent on the, the you know. Some, this sex and large quantities of alcohol to just keep, just to keep functioning as human beings. But that it is all more, it's more nuanced than that, isn't it, Gary? Yeah. I was wondering who was going to get to say the word nuanced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've got both types of, of soldier in one person. You've got the hero, you know, the savior of Belgium, for example, uh, can be exactly the same person as the one that, uh, as Pete likes to say, you know, moans consistently all the time. Where I say that the British soldier never moans, but they observe a lot. <laughs> they observe like that. So you've got the British soldier on the Western Front up to up to his knees and sometimes higher in mud. They're soaking wet. They're being shot at by every weapon known to to the German opposition, and yet it, it's, they're still determined to see the funny side of life because they have to. Right. Because yeah. otherwise they're not going to cope. And uh, one of the first quotes, if I may, that we thought explained this is uh, by a Captain Hubert Rees of the 2nd Welsh Regiment. Which Welsh? Like yeah, he was, very, <laughs> he was very posh, though. Very he was posh. very posh, though. <laughs> not for one moment, though I wish to imply that the war was anything but a horrible business. But a sense of humour was almost a necessity to prevent the combatants from going mad. There is no doubt that the men who took the war too seriously and were able to see no humour in it could not stand the strain. I say combatants surprisingly because a sense of humour was not confined to the British. Therefore, one or two notorious war books dealing with the horrors of the war in which is depicted a state of affairs in which it would be impossible to remain sane cannot be accepted as a true reflection. Yeah, that's good. That, that, and the, we thought that one summed it up. That's why we put it in the uh, the preface sort of thing. Yeah. Um, it, it gives you the picture of, of what it's about. Yeah, we. I mean, we should say up front here, we didn't want to write a funny book, and we right. probably succeeded. <laughs> 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 but what we wanted to do, we, we want to recognise uh, the the heroes that these men were in many cases, uh, but also the frailties of being, you know, the human condition. Yeah. And, and they're thrown into an extraordinary situation. Well, and I, I, one of the things that really struck me too in reading it is that um, just how necessary humor was. I mean, they're not being flip when they're doing this, but this is, this is a vital survival tool. It, it is, it, it, it's how else are they going to manage if you think about it, uh, right. it, it, it's 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 all they've got, uh, and and it it goes hand in hand with comradeship, and, and the idea that you you're with your mates, and what do mates do? Well, they they try and laugh at anything. That it, I mean, if if you like football, then you have a shared laughter when your team does badly. You you know even when you're struck down with misery you'll joke about things it's the same in in everything uh, and that's what we feel that's how people got through the war um and we've got quotes from all sorts of things i mean um 
I, I, I think this one should I do that one by Private Arthur Dolby? It's a short one. It's just about recruitment, and yeah. it's just short. But uh, this is pri Private. Oh, I'll have to do my generic Northern, of course. Fifteenth <laughs> uh, West Yorkshire Regiment, and he says this. Aye, he looked at me and he says, "Sallow complexion, prominent nose, mole on right cheek." Before he'd done with me, I felt a bit like Frankenstein. Then he says, initials. I say, F.A. He says, you're going to have some trouble with that. <laughs> F.A. in the army doesn't stand for your initials. <laughs> and of course, it doesn't it stand for fuck all. <laughs> and darn, I thought it was field artillery. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, I, 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 you said something that I uh, that I really think is is so important, which is that uh, um, Gary, we, it, you didn't intend to write a funny book, and it is a funny book in many places. But it's not funny because it's hey, light moments in the trenches, you know, humorous things that happen to soldiers, like Reader's Digest uh, humor in uniform. It's it's really about bringing you as close as possible to the granular detail often horrifying, sometimes uh, capricious, all sorts of other adjectives, um, of life in the trenches. And some of it is very affecting. I mean, it's, it's very, very moving, um, it, and it's not light at all. It's about sort of trying to render the horrors in a way that, that we can at least comprehend them. Although I do wonder if it really isn't all kind of beyond the, compre the comprehension of all of us who weren't there, which I think is all of us. Yeah, I agree entirely. I think that um, one of the things that is a constant, though, is um, there is something known as, as military humour. Um, soldiers, when they are together, uh, can laugh at each other and they can laugh at what's going on around them. And I think that is a theme throughout the book. You're quite right. Some of it is horrific. Some of it's not funny at all. But it's, it's the circumstances in which they're saying it. Um, there's a section on dogs, for example, uh, pets. And um, uh, there's, we haven't got the quote, but there's, there's one where this poor dog, uh, the soldier's ordered to kill the dog. And basically, he shoots it about 56 times and the dog keeps coming back. And you just think, that's horrific. You know, it really right. is horrific. But in the but context... It makes you laugh. <laughs> In the context of what we're trying to say, it makes you laugh. But there was a, there was another story, if I can prompt one, about uh, about uh, 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 two men who set out to uh, to do some ill to their uh, to their sergeant. Oh. Uh, you, I think you have that one handy. I'll, I do. I'll, I'll stretch out my introduction of it a little bit longer as you more ooms and ahs there, right? through the pages. <laughs> I like to carry page, that one. That's page fifty six. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this came from Robert Graves, and, and Pete yeah. sometimes <laughs> is uh, a bit sceptical uh, about um, Graves and whether or not, you know, there's there's actually truth in this. But there, this is actually true, uh, and uh, this did happen to two soldiers, uh, a Private Morgan and a Lance Corporal William Price, and this is what they say. Two young miners in another company disliked their sergeant, who had a down on them and gave them all the most dirty and dangerous jobs. When they were in billets, he crimed them for things they hadn't done, so they decided to kill him. Later, they reported at battalion orderly room and asked to see the adjutant. This was irregular, because a private is forbidden to address an officer without an NCO of his own company acting as go-between. The adjutant happened to see them and asked, well, what is it you want? Smartly slapping the small of the butt of their sloped rifles, they said, we've come to report, sir, that we're very sorry, but we've shot our company sergeant major. The adjutant said, good heavens, how did that happen? It was an accident, sir. What do you mean, you damn fools? Did you mistake him for a spy? No, sir. We mistook him for our platoon sergeant. <laughs> so they were both court-martialed and shot by a firing squad of their own company, against the wall of a convent at Bethieu. And that is true. And the sergeant major that they killed was company sergeant major Hugh Hayes, uh, who they killed on the 20th of, of January, mm -hmm. 1918. And they were executed by firing squad on the 15th of February, uh, 1915.
which is not so funny for anybody. Not so funny. No. 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 And we should explain for anybody who doesn't know, uh, perhaps one of you can explain who Robert Graves is, because I think that's an important name for people. Uh, Robert Graves is the minor poet uh, and uh, and uh, and raconteur and author. And he, he wrote uh, he, he wrote a very famous book about the Great Wall, the name of which has gone out of my head. Is it, it, goodbye it, to all that. Goodbye, goodbye to all that. Goodbye and, to all that, uh, yes. But it is slightly fictionalized, and he wrote it to make money. So it 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 bigs up things, and it it it, it you yeah. know he, he became very unpopular in his regiment, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, because yeah. of it. Uh, but later on, he he went on to a great career, and uh, and uh, and uh, he 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 did, he he wrote I Claudius. He wrote many yeah. things, and was a very interesting man indeed. But you can't trust everything he says. Especially yeah, yeah, when it's yeah. a good story. But that one, we looked it up. It was true. Yeah. Well, and oh, go ahead, Chris. No, no, no. no. Well, I was just going to say maybe you were going to go to the same place, which maybe it's this is a good segue to, to talk about uh, the research that you did for this book. You know, where you where you found some of this material, and one would presume, uh, Peter, since you spent uh, a day or two working for the Imperial War Museum, uh, interviewing uh, veterans, and starting out with World War One veterans. Say, that, that's what my boss says. Over the thirty nine years, <laughs> he, he, he reckoned I spent a day or two working. Yeah. So I assume. Hi, Bryn. <laughs> well, you were always out doing an interview someplace. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, 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 uh, I assume some of them came from the interviews you yourself did with veterans, but uh, and 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 how else did you go about trying to sift through and find uh, find material? Well, we did it. We did it together, which is why this book was extremely enjoyable because we did do it together. Uh, so we divided up the book. I've got a, a library. I mean, that's one tenth of it, sort of thing. And we sort of divided the books up, and we just went through them looking for stories that were laugh or cry material i.e that made you laugh made you cry or or just uh just 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 or sometimes just interesting because uh, we you know and um and then together we went through them and uh, worked out how they'd work together and we and, and that's where we we strimmed out at least as much again as went in the book because uh, sometimes uh, you lose you can't see the wood for the trees if you put too many in uh, and we, we're very happy with it, aren't we, Gary, wherever you are? Oh, there you are. Hello. <laughs> yeah, we are. And Pete's got a library and, and, and I've got a book by Richard Van Emden. <laughs> Who you are to, yes. Oh, but, your favourite. <laughs> oh, so we can see it there. Yeah. Uh, and obviously I went through that uh, a number of times. <laughs> but what Pete's not saying is this all happened against the backdrop of, of COVID and lockdown. Um, so the majority of this was actually done as we're doing now, um, using, uh, in our case, uh, a, a, a rival platform, a different platform, Zoom, as everybody did during that time. Um, and and we, uh, we would literally sit sharing the screen and go yeah. through the various things. And um, we had a system where Pete would go through his stuff and put it, I can't remember, Pete, was it green you used or something? Yeah. And I would use red. And then when we brought it together, we'd see who whose was whose. And we only disagreed about one, I think, of one quote of the whole uh, 80, 90,000 words. Um, okay, what, what was it? We need yeah, to, you can't. You can't everybody you now needs to know. Uh, well, it, I don't it remember. Went in. No, no, it went in um, because it didn't, it didn't sit neatly uh, with what we were trying to do. It was a, a quote about a chap went on uh, embarkation leave home to Leeds, I think it was, certainly the Yorkshire area. And somehow his mum had found out, he hadn't told her, that he was going off to France the next day. And as he's going that. up the garden path, she's hanging round his ankle. Oh, oh yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's, yeah. and he's being dragged up, he's dragging his mother up to the garden gate. Well, that we couldn't work out how you would get that in the book, but I, I insisted that I really liked it because I had, and I still have that vision in my head. Whenever I talk yeah. about it, I've been dragging his mum up the garden path. Yeah. Well, so we got it in. One of the things too that I, I, I was really I thought was really interesting is you know, you talk a little bit about um, sort of those the early recruitment, you know, because again these a lot of these guys aren't professional soldiers, so you, you just have some interesting comments on officer recruitment and also that transition uh, these guys are making from being civilians to all of a sudden 
they're supposed to be soldiers and that's not necessarily an easy transition to make um and so i don't know if there are any any uh, quotes i've got I've, I've got a quote by james lovegrove who who is at the royal irish fusiliers depot now i didn't actually interview him but i i was aware of him because he was quite a, quite a strange man and uh, i knew my colleague who interviewed him but he said this one day i was sent for by the colonel i had never seen him up to then he said your sergeant has recommended you what would you like to be Oh, I said, a sergeant. He said, would you? Do you swear? Oh, no, sir. Do you drink? No, sir. Have you got a girlfriend? I said, no, sir. I, even, even, I hadn't even kissed a girl up to then. I was dead scared of girls, I might tell you. Well, he said, I don't know. What the hell is the good of you being a sergeant? The only thing I can think of, my boy, is for you to be an officer. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, that, that's, uh, that's, that, that that's was all how they street. pick them. Well, well there is an element. <laughs> They're not there, like there, that now. There, there, oh, there is an, there's <laughs> an element in your book. There's a, there's an old joke, uh, which is, um, uh, you know, everybody here is an idiot except for you and me. And I'm not sure about you. Uh, and, and it seems to me regarding your book that perhaps one or two of the soldiers in the British Army in World War One might have taken a similar attitude. There's a, a wee bit of stereotyping going on, whether it's officers talking about enlisted men, enlisted men about officers, French, Germans, um, uh, probably Welsh. I don't remember. Uh, you know, everybody coming in for it uh, at some point. I mean, that is kind of some of the humor that's there. Yeah, and it goes wider than that. You know, it's it's regional as well. So you have the Northerners think of every Londoner as a Cockney. You know, um, even <laughs> <laughs> even if they're not. Um, and uh, you know, all Northerners are Northerners. They're not Yorkshiremen or uh, I've just Scousers what... or anything else. Go I on. just remember what we call Cockneys, Cockney wankers. <laughs> <laughs> I've remembered now. <laughs> no, the lightning bolt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's true. You're, you're we right. Northerners I mean, do. Some of it is... Um, Chris is removing his headphones. I don't know. I, 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 I accidentally <laughs> unplugged them. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> accidentally. And I yeah. usually, I usually, uh, by the way, mute myself once during every program. So it uh, hasn't happened yet, yeah, but, it, but it uh, wait for it. Wait for it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's a, it, some of it's competition. Uh, you know, the, the army and the, indeed the forces, they thrive on competition. So they get into competition between, uh, you know, the, the Northerners, the Londoners, the officers, the NCOs, the men. And, and that comes through the book as well, I think, that there's this constant competing with each other. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there's also some interesting interactions um, between you talk about the Australians quite a bit versus versus the Brits. And, and I, Pete, I mentioned this to you. You don't mention the Canadians, so I think you have a personal bias against the Canadians. But Not at all. But... They're lovely. Every <laughs> single... They're all lovely. And it's mainly because they completely lack a sense of humour. Although... <laughs> although... <laughs> although... New Zealanders <laughs> really, we struggled like mad to find anything with amusing yeah, from a New Zealander, didn't we, oh. Barry? Well, and <laughs> South African. We found, I think, one South African. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but bear in mind at that time, they were all in the British Army. Yeah, they were. Yeah. So, and, uh, and 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 all those oh, I mean New Zealanders were brilliant and the Canadians were brilliant, the Canadian course were brilliant. you know, there's no need to uh, to, to oh, really get why do you think there are so many quotes from Australians? Because obviously you're going back to sources that are there. So did they just? Uh, uh, well, our original intended uh, product. It's as simple as the original person who signed the contract for the book was Australian, yeah. and also the Australians are funnier. I think. Uh, I think now we are, <laughs> we ought to perhaps one of our most famous uh, accents that has caused comments across the globe is our version of. <laughs> Australian. And this is Private George Mitchell, 48th Australian Battalion. He said this, we headed back to a shell hole from which we'd continually drawn a most excellent supply. But when we arrived on this occasion, the water had drained off. Lying peacefully on the bottom was a large and very dead fritz. And the water seemed so good, said one. It was soup, you goat. 
replied an unsympathetic onlooker. Now, I'm sure he didn't say you goat, by the way. <laughs> Just as a tip. But uh, so that's that's that, that that I think was the almost perfect Australian accent. What do you think, Gary? I think that was rubbish. So I'm now going to do a, a, a quote by the same private George Mitchell. <laughs> oh, well, I, we, we will ask the lads, Chris and Rick, to judge. Yeah. Well, we'll ask the audience to judge. I want everyone oh, to brilliant. say whose oh, Australian brilliant. accent is better. Get ready, okay? A fussy little major from another battalion blew up. Oh, All beams and bounce. Where is company headquarters, my man? He asked. A 5.9 inch landing in a thunderous flame pierced blast of destruction. It was just where that shell landed. I couldn't say where it is now. He gave me a dirty look, opened his mouth to say something, but changed his mind. If you go now, sir, you will arrive just as the next shell lands. He gave me another black look, but took the hint and waited. <laughs> Oh, bollocks. I think you were okay. better. <laughs> All right. Yeah. We have we have everyone now who's who's watching live has to vote. Who has the better Australian uh, accent? Well, Pete who was Gary or Gladly Gary? Gary, Gary I, you know, uh, I don't want to say I don't want to say what I think. Right. I'm going to let the audience say without uh, without uh, any uh, without oh, from, from Chris oh, and I. Yeah. But uh, uh, we're getting well, some. We're getting some disagreement, though. We are getting disagreement. So. We, well, we get um, a lot of criticism for our accents, but, <laughs> but we are both of Scottish heritage. And that heritage. is completely understandable. <laughs> uh, we, we are both of Scottish heritage. And in fact, my direct parents Aye. are Scottish. Aye. Aye. We cannot do a Scottish accent. No, I know you can. <laughs> Except for the word Aye. Aye. <laughs> uh, the other thing we're famous for is our, uh, our singing. Oh, yes. <laughs> and now you're going to... Uh... Well, the, the, this is... We're not going to sing it in Australia because that would be stretching us both too far, I think. But this is by Lieutenant Walter Belford, another Australian, 11th Australian Battalion. And this is uh, some uh, a, po a, a song found in the uh, in a diary by uh, from a private G.W. Cotterell. Uh, and G Gary will lead us off on this, so you've gone to the wrong one. Uh, we're both going to be singing this. Gary, take it away. What is this slimy dismal howl? We're off on life, looking like, like a mole. Like a mole. And, cursing and cursing the Ger German's heart and heart soul. And soul. <laughs> My dugout, where it is that beneath the floor, the water's rising more and more. And where my oh, where's room's my... a broken door. My dugout, where is it that I try to sleep? Betwixt the lungs, then up I leap. And dash through water four foot deep. My, my dugout. dugout. Where is it that I catch a chill and lose my only quinine pill and probably remain until I'm dug oh. out? <laughs> Thanks, no. Pete. Yeah, Pete, you're right. No. What uh, happened this, there was... This uh, software I mean, is not made for uh, live uh, duetting. It, it's something called latency. And you, as soon yes. as you start, you realize yeah, you it, cannot do it together. It's, it, oh, it, that was quite interesting, Gary. <laughs> uh, I, I, wanna, there, I just want to uh, say that we have a couple of uh, comments on accents here. Many comments, but just to bring a couple <laughs> up. Uh, Peter has the better accent, but you both need to work on it, says Suzanne. Oh. Uh, and then uh, uh, Steve says, Gary, for me, it was Bastard. like Dame Edna was in the room. Oh, well, oh. yeah. <laughs> okay. And then, Actually, we know him. Hi, and, Steve. Oh, and then, Steve. And then uh, Barry says, probably Rick or Chris. <laughs> Barry, you're a complete <laughs> bastard. Nobody <laughs> likes you. <laughs> you live on your own. <laughs> um I want to remind everybody that we are uh, this this visual episode of Pete and Gary's military podcast <laughs> is actually called History Happy Hour. But we are talking today on History Happy Hour with uh, Peter Hart and Gary Bain, who are the authors of the book Laugh or Cry, The British Soldier on the Western Front, 1914 to 1918. Ooh. Something I wanted to bring up, it's not really in your book, but one Ooh. of the great examples of British soldiers demonstrating using humor to cope with life in the trenches is the Wipers Times, the satirical uh, magazine newspaper that uh, British soldiers published in Ypres, which of course they called Wipers, because uh, it's spelled Y-P-R-E-S. Uh, there's a wonderful book about this, uh, which inspired a BBC movie. There's a scene in the movie uh, where there's an officer 
uh, harumphing, as British officers tend to do uh, in movies. Uh, and uh, I'll, so I'll do an accent. <clears throat> oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, he's harumphing about this humor newspaper, and he says, War is not funny, damn it. And the other officer says, well, I, I rather think that's the point. <laughs> and uh, so uh, maybe because war is the unfunniest thing around, you kind of need humor. So I, I was interested in um, uh, your kind of, uh, you, I kind of, to be honest, kind of thought I might have seen some stuff from the Wipers Times in your book and then, you know, it didn't. So talk a little bit about that. Well, I'll start. Um, I've, I've got the Wipers Times. Um, it's by Ian Hislop, I think. I think he produced the play yeah. and the and the. Uh, the TV film as well. Um, in fact, I've got two copies of it for some bizarre reason. We did think about, um, in fact, we did look through the Wipers Times. We did. Uh, but we couldn't find anything that we thought would support the premise that we were trying for. There are funny things in the Wipers Times. You know, don't get me wrong. And, um, you know, one of our one of our stories, probably an a, a apocryphal story, is about a, a, a guy... Uh, walking along the road and there's a there's a tin helmet on the road and he lifts it and there's a chap there and he says um who are you and he says i'm driver such and such and he says where's your lorry and he says i'm standing on it that sort of thing <laughs> would would i think be found in the wipers sure. times yeah. um but whilst we started off looking at things like the wipers time um cockney war stories was another one i think um there you go yeah cockney war stories um, we ended up not actually using very much from that sort of source because we found a wealth of material from the soldiers themselves, from the oral history, yeah. um, from uh, some of the uh, uh, regimental histories even. Were, They're were really right. funny, some of them. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so we sort of veered away from that, but that's exactly where we started. And the Wipers Times was one of the things that we did research. Yeah. Yeah, was it? I think the second six Lancashire Fusiliers, which no one's ever heard of, and uh, I actually bought it for Gary for his Christmas present, and he bought me this. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but Peter, you were also saying that the the we were chatting about this before the show when when. You know, Gary wasn't there yet. Not, yeah, not well, he was a bit yet. late, wasn't we, he? We just want to one know, minute rub that, <laughs> that in. Um, you were saying that that the some of the stuff in the Wipers Times just isn't as funny to us now as it kind of was to British soldiers during the war. Yeah, well, since a uh, sense the humor changes over the years, so I think it was funny for for the people who wrote it then and for the people who understood it and lived it, but. Things have sort of moved on a bit with humour. I mean, if you look at 1960s things, it's situation comedies, they seem very slow moving and, 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 and not so funny now. And I think part of that is with the wipers time. And to be honest, we found things that we found in the books, the articles, the, uh, the uh, oral history were funnier than the stuff in the wipers times. Yeah. Uh, and there was also more swearing, and both I and Gary are very fond of swearing. Um, <laughs> Would and, you like uh, to do some? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Would that help relieve some stress? I, I figured this was a transition. I was just trying to help you along, Pete. But while you're looking, while you're looking for that, I'm desperately though, looking for. So while you're looking for that, I, I will oh, yeah. bring up that we well, do have a tally on the uh, accents okay so oh. uh catherine her says gary is by a nose the winner seven to five well that's just nobody it's very you. pretty small nose as well <laughs> very delicate very uh, nice. i draw from that that we're both appalling well while <laughs> he's looking I, just one no, more thing on the wipers <laughs> times um rather bizarrely uh, they um they found the printing machine as you as you know and it didn't have e it, they, they didn't have a letter E. So a number of the, of the uh, publications were made without any letter E in it. And I find that quite funny. I'd love to yeah. read a, 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 a whole newspaper without a letter E in it. How great. did they do what, that? What well, well, you have to read it and, 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 you know, I'd, I'd have issued a free pencil with every issue to put in your own ink. <laughs> <laughs> I helped pass the time. Uh, I, I think right, perhaps... Peter, uh, Gary, over to you. 
Gary's best at singing. So uh, it's by the fact that I'm a singer in a punk band. But Gary will say that's why Gary's better at singing. I think we'll do Fred Dixon's. This is oral history as well. 10th Queen's Royal West Surrey Regiment. And I'll introduce it. And then Gary will sing it. I, I would have joined him. But it, the latency makes it not work. But uh, this is Fred Dixon said, when we're on the march, some wag would start up a bit of doggerel. Go, Gary. We won't be buggered about. We won't. We won't, we won't be buggered about. We won't. We won't. We won't be buggered about. We, we won't. We won't be buggered about. And that would be taken up by the whole battalion, Fred said. Uh, and, they, you know, th th that's that's p p fa fairly par par of the course. Um, I've, I've just realised I've had latency in my sex life since 1987. <laughs> 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 oh, <sorry. laughs> So you have, uh, to have, you have to have humor to get to the <laughs> happy hour. And now we Chris, did it. you see the uh, the 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 uh, question from Gene Templin? I think this has, well, must, I, must yeah, be brought yeah. on to the screen Especially here after for we a discussion. Were yesterday, we all know oh. that Chris Anderson is a big fan oh. of Arsenal football. I don't even know Arsenal what that would be. Football is a sport that. We're playing a Super Bowl in here today in the United uh, States. But you anyway. Where you, do, where you don't use your feet. That's yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, way, the appropriate way. Le Lieutenant Horace Pavier of the 167th wasn't a fan of Arsenal with his comment about lice and the Arsenal fans. I am assuming this is from the book that you have written. Or we have perhaps it prepared. Uh, I know, but uh, any comment about football from over 100 years ago, or I'll just add to that anything, you know, that you'd like to say to Chris Anderson. Well, I think um, if, if we're going to talk about Arsenal, the uh, the Great War saved Arsenal from relegation because they were supposed to be relegated. The war got in the way. And then after the war, they, there was some skullduggery involving a backhander, I believe. And they were voted back into the top division. So they're, uh, they were the only top team never to have been relegated in the premiership at, at the moment but they've been, getting, they've been kept they've been making us suffer for that ever since oh absolutely, so, <laughs> the absolutely. only reason i even know about relegation is from watching ted lasso i like ted lasso <laughs> jerry won't do. watch it he won't yeah. watch it chris he likes it like, he doesn't like the bad language in it <laughs> i love it i think it's fantastic i'm waiting for the next episode me too we could all uh, chant. But I will read uh, Horace Pavier's quote, if I may. Ah, please. You found it. When an occasional opportunity arose in the early dawn hours, I stripped to my Batman through dirty water taken from shell holes in a canvas bucket all over me, much to the amusement of nearby onlookers. Removing blankets lying on the wire bunks and casting them aside on the ground, I began to wonder if I was developing delusions. The blankets were moving in all directions, and on closer examination, I realized that this was caused by the infestation of millions of lice. My machine gunners also became infested, and whenever possible, removed their shirts to pick off any visible lice. On one occasion, I heard one say to another, there goes another Arsenal supporter, as he threw it away. I gathered that the remark was made on account of its color. <sighs> All right, Rick, you feeling better now? I'm I'm just uh, trying to bring history to the people. Yes, yeah. and Arsenal. <laughs> Let's bring Arsenal. <laughs> Let's bring and Arsenal any, to the people, yeah. And any, any of mention Arsenal. of Arsenal, good or bad, is, is another point in the book. No. Mr. Okay. Anderson, over to you. Well, no, I, I think, you know, we, you've, you've, you've mocked the pain and suffering of Arsenal fans as well as, you know, lice-infested Brit British soldiers. But um, Happy to do it. Using, I, I'm good. But, you know, using some of the quotes that you've, you've provided, can you talk a little bit about just kind of life in the trenches? And you have some you also have some really great quotes about, you know, the ultimate test of a soldier going into combat. And, and how do you find a story that's funny about about that situation? Well, I mean, one, one about going into no man's land with a wiring party was told to me by Private Harold Hayward. So the reason I know is because in 1984 or something, I interviewed him. What a wonderful old boy he was. He was in the 12th Gloucestershire Regiment, who are, as you know, a fine body of men. Body event. And he said this, and, and I, I, I used to love it. I can remember his face creasing up as he told me it. And he said this, the first time he went over wire, and of course, everything was shh, 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 going out over the top tonight. 
go quietly, not a word to one another. We're going to make a proper continuous line. I just happened to step to one side and I went up to me neck into a French latrine. I said, help, help. They said, shh, shh. I thought, I'm not going to die like this. When my parents asked, what caused his death? They fell into a latrine and was drowned. <laughs> they pushed their rifles down. I caught hold of two of them and they pulled me out. But no one would come near me for the rest of the time in the line. And it was fairly, you know. And I, for me, that story is part of my life as well because he told it to me sort of yeah. 40 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's lived with me ever since. <laughs> I've learned so much. Never fall into a latrine. Yeah, words to live by. Important life lessons. So, what, well, what was yeah. it? But what was it like? You know, I mean, um, all of us. I mean, uh, Chris and I. Uh, you guys, we've we've spoken to to soldiers about what they did. But but in talking to these World War One veterans, um, when when he told that story, I mean. You know, kind of. I, I don't. I don't know quite how to get at this. But, but, what was that like for you? What was it like for you? You, you were. Uh, uh, this is probably what forty years ago or so. Thirty okay. years ago. Cool. You know, talking to these veterans, kind of getting these stories, like this, sitting presumably in their living rooms or or wherever, and learning about them. It it, it was a weird job, um, uh, in many ways, and. But you've got it, in some ways, it's like any other job. So, you know, you turn up with a hangover. Well, I was what? I was in my late 20s. So you turn up with a hangover, you know, <laughs> you sit there for two hours. But when they were really good, like Harold Haywood was or Joe Murray or one of the other great veterans, it was an absolute joy. And you learn so much from them. Um, I, 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 I didn't know. I mean, I was supposed to be a historian because I did that for, for university, but... I learned most of it from people telling me and, uh, you know, and then you read around it and you get to learn it. Uh, and they, they did have a, the, the sense of humour came out. I mean, that story is part of it. Uh, and another one, when he got shot through his left testicle. And I remember Harold telling me there was a posh lady who kept coming to the, 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 the uh, hospital and kept saying, where were you wounded? And he said, Gullimore. She came in again and said, where were you wounded? And he said, and eventually he said, well, if, if you were wounded where I was wounded, you wouldn't be wounded at all. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently she never came back after she worked it out. <laughs> and it's also you, worth noting that, you know, when you're of a certain age, even, you know, my age, I'm much younger than you, Pete. Yeah. Um, when when I was young, we, we were surrounded by people who yeah. had served... Uh, in various ways in the Great War. Uncles and, and grandfathers. I used to go to a pub on a Sunday with my with my dad when I was about 15 years old. And he would play cribbage with some Great War veterans. And um, after a few pints, they'd start singing. And they'd sing, you know, all, all the songs that you would associate with the Great War. And to, to my eternal shame, I never sat and talked about them. I didn't have the interest I have now. Yeah. Um, but I, I spent every Sunday with these with these chaps for about a year before I I went in the uh, the junior leaders myself, and I and I never had a real conversation with them, and it's such yeah. a shame. And very well, soon yeah. they'll be gone. Yeah. Well, one of the one of the questions I had is, you know, we've all spent a lot of time talking to veterans, and and I know both of you have talked to not only great war veterans, but but World War II veterans, and you talk about them on your show. And there's a lot of uh, of a soldier's experience that it doesn't matter what war they're in. I think that there are some universal stories. But are there any differences that you that strikes you between, say, a, a World War One British soldier and a World War Two soldier? Do they? Have, is there any the differences, or or at all? Um, you know, the only one that ever struck me was that they used to they used to talk about their mother more when they were wounded of that. Uh, but no, uh, soldiers are soldiers. I interviewed Gary under strange circumstances because <laughs> Gary had an undistinguished career in the army. <laughs> he was the only private in the intelligence corps for many times. He was also a lads corporal occasionally. Uh, but the point was that I decided that as he became uh, nearly boss of Transport for London, which is a big wheel, commercial director. I, t I said to him, you, the army really missed your potential. They missed everything that, you know, 
the drive, the brains, the, the looks, the charm that, that took him to the top. And and then I, I went and interviewed him for three or four sessions. And at the end of that, I knew why the army had binned him. <laughs> Bloody useless. <laughs> Oh. He's a drunken, feckless article. And yeah. now he's changed. Now I'm this not. Is... Yeah. <laughs> Where's that bottle of whiskey gun? I think, oh. I think we, need, we, need, we need to give Gary equal time here. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't I, let him respond. <laughs> no, not at all. I think it, it's a great question. I think I agree. Soldiers are soldiers and humour is humour. But sometimes the Second World War when you think of the circumstances, what they were fighting against, that's not very funny. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we've embarked on our second book, although we can't quite decide on the title yet. I don't know which one we're using at the moment. Um, and we're, we're struggling <laughs> to find humour. It's about the, the Royal Flying Corps. Mm -hmm. And we're struggling to find humour when they're not on the ground. We're right. on the ground and in the mess. There's, there's Hilarious. Of yeah. When they're actually in the air, it's not that funny. There's a couple, but yeah, yeah. Um, I found one today which really tickled me, where he he, he drops the Lewis gun on a Fokker below them. You know, and <laughs> as, as what was he? Out, what, what was he flying? Um, oh, I can't. He was he was an observer no, in no. the back. The German. What was he flying? <laughs> oh, the old ones are the best. No, the <laughs> fucker jokes are just, you know, thank God that they're there. Yes. So, so, okay, so I'm going to tell you guys a story. Uh, uh, so oh. you're, 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 uh, the, 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 everyone's. <laughs> now, now look at our numbers oh, are going down. Sleep. So um, uh, your book focuses on British soldiers in the trenches. So my great uncle. Bill Byer served in the New York 69th, the famous Fighting 69th uh, American Regiment in World War II, part of the 42nd Division, the Rainbow Division, uh, and he is the only World War I veteran that I can recall spending a substantial amount of time talking to about the war, and it was in 1970, which was a year before he died. And the one story he liked to tell, he was a sergeant, he was somehow out in no man's land uh, alone during some sort of night action. It's pitch black, he's stumbling around, uh, comes across another soldier huddled in a blanket uh, trying to catch some sleep, essentially says, you know, move over soldier, uh, you know, we'll share that blanket. Um, and in the morning, the other soldier says to him, how did you sleep, sergeant? And the other soldier turned out to be General Douglas MacArthur. So, you see, my uncle slept with Douglas MacArthur is the, ah. punch, the wonderful punchline of this joke. Um, and look, I'm sure that Bill saw some serious fighting. I mean, when I remember when I interviewed him, uh, I didn't interview him. I was just chatting with him. I was 14. But he was sitting there at the kitchen table of my aunt's house with a, a bottle of gin on the table, which he basically would just drain every day and have a new one the next day. And I'm sure he saw some very difficult fighting. But I, it, it seemed to me that, that looking back on it and then looking at your book as well, that humor was kind of, you know, it's a way of filtering the experiences after the fact so that you can live with them or so that you can you can make them relatable to somebody who wasn't there. I th yes, I, I think that that's entirely true. Um, uh, I mean, if if you think about it, if you're talking about to talking to 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 children, which you were then, Rick, I was, yeah. Uh, then you you are going to reach for the humorous side of life. You're not going to talk about when a bit of a five point nine took the. The, the skull off your, your neighborhood, you know, the, your neighbor. You're not going to talk about someone being gut shot or, or having his balls shot off. You're just not, or, or having dysentery or any of those things. Um, you might talk about falling in a latrine, but, you know, you're not going to talk about the, 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 the privations and horrors. You're just not. And I think that's part where they talked about it. And, and I know Gary does this now. Um, is uh, uh, Gary? Perhaps you'd like to say something because Gary's still in touch with all the people that he served with, and that's what the First World War and Second World War veterans did. They were they formed regimental associations, the British Legion, and they 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 talked there about what happened. And then, of course, Panther. But Gary, tell us. I mean, you're still in touch with the lads from your uh, your your intake, yeah. aren't you? 
I, I sent Pete a, a photo of a WhatsApp message uh, that I was involved in. I can't remember why I sent it to him, and I didn't think about it at the time. But what he noticed about it was, A, somebody was talking about organising a reunion, mm-hmm. and B, we then talked about somebody who died. Um, yeah. And Pete said, you know, that that was, you know, that didn't surprise him at all, uh, because, you know, obviously WhatsApp didn't exist 50 years ago. So uh, they would do it when they met, when they went to the British Legion, when they would have reunions, that's when they would talk about these things, uh, when they got together, uh, yeah. because that's the only opportunity they had to talk about them. Yeah. And, and both, we've all talked, I know I've mentioned this before, Uncle Albert syndrome, which is, you know, families will say he never liked to talk about it. He did, but whenever he did... <laughs> People went, oh, for God's sake, Uncle Albert, put a sock in it. You told us that ten times, you know. And yeah. and, and families always say, no, we never did that, but they do, yeah. you know. Uh, and and that's just the way it is. Um, it's quite sad, really, but uh, there you go. <laughs> well, now, given, you know, clearly you guys both brought a huge wealth of knowledge of of the, the Tommy Atkins in World War One and, and, and that, that whole experience, but as you were – Kind of looking at World War One through their eyes and through the lens of humor. Is there anything that really surprised you, or that you caused you to like maybe look at them a little bit differently? Or no, I don't think anything surprised me. Um, I, I can't speak for Pete. Um, I think that um, what I what I found most surprising was the wealth of information that was funny. Um, you know, we've mentioned that uh, some of the uh, official histories are f- not funny, but there are sections of them that are humorous. Mm-hmm. Um, if you take our original intent was that we were going to call the book um, and then the poll broke. One of the surprising things was the latrines on the Western Front are not poles. Actually, they're quite <laughs> substantial because um, in some cases they're, they're concrete blocks um so so we had to change direction there so nothing surprised us uh, i i think other than the 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 amount of information that was available as pete said there's a whole book that we we put in what we called gary's dump for some reason um of material that we took out and 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 just dumped right (laughs) why did we call it gary's dump (laughs) uh no reason gary (laughs) How about we, we've got two very short quotes. Sure, let's, think, let's end with, let's um, let the soldiers okay. tell us. I'll just, they're, they're next to each other. They're just the daftness of the humour. This one made me laugh out loud and when I first heard it. And it's Rifleman Francis Sumter of the 1st Rifle Brigade. And he said, uh, they were a Saxon regiment officers. They seemed to be friendly people, seemed to be friendly. As a sign of their friend, a sign of their friendliness was they put up a sign, Got Mittens, God is with us. We put up a sign in English. We've got mittens too. <laughs> I, mean, I, I just love the idea of these signs going up in no man's land. Got mittens. We got mittens too. <laughs> yeah, actually, I was surprised by all the signs because you had a few stories about signs. Uh, that, that, the, the, that, that was certainly something the, that surprised me. And you got and one then, more there for us? Uh, well, Gary's, this is one of Gary's all-time favorite stories, isn't it, Gary? Oh, is it? <laughs> <laughs> if only he knew which one it was. I presume he's does. talking about Captain Charles May. No, I'm talking about Private Lionel Renton. Oh, of course you are. Oh, I don't like that one. <laughs> you do like that one. So this is Private Lionel Renton uh, of the 16th Middlesex Regiment. Now, Middlesex Regiment is public schools battalion, so they all spoke really posh. And he says... You seem happy enough despite the bombardment. Oh, I'm happy enough, sir, replied the postman. Though equal in rank with Lionel, he addressed anyone with an educated voice as sir, whether officer or in the ranks. You can have a bombardment any time, sir, he said. But it's not every day you get a cheese sandwich. (laughs) (laughs) And now the the next one, because you mentioned football. And uh, so very cleverly combining Gary's favourite quote with football. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, Captain Charles May, who who uh, 
wrote a, a brilliant, but well, it, a brilliant account, which was in the War Museum, and I used it in my song book. It, it's a, a, a quote that, just to give you the laugh or cry, it was a quote that was so sad about his child. He was killed on the first day of the song, and he wrote a letter home to his wife and child saying, and it was so sad that for years I wouldn't read it aloud because I thought I might be upset. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. But this is the other side of it. This is a really fun, so that's the crime. This is a really funny quote done by Charles May. Gary, go ahead. The dear old English Tommy only has, and I expect will ever only have, one idea of warfare. That is to walk up to a Johnny and stick a bayonet into him. In the aggregate, that is his sole aim and object. He cannot dissemble, has no cunning, and only a canteen interest in strategy, and only then as an excuse to blither with a friend over a can of beer. He cares nothing for the idea of stealth, is not really built for quietly stealing on an unsuspecting foe. As proof, you only need put one tin can in a 60-acre field and turn two Tommies loose in that field to do a silent night march. I will guarantee that in three minutes, one has stumbled, stumbled over the can and that in a further three, both have kicked it. There must, I think, be some magnetism between ammunition, boots and odd cans which unknown people have discarded in out-of-the-way places. And I always like to add to that, in another three minutes, they'd have been kicking it around and playing football with it. Oh, the edge. <laughs> And on oh. that note, uh, guys, thank you so much for thank joining us chance. today. And uh, just a reminder that we've been talking to Pete Hart and Gary Bain, who are the authors of Laugh or Cry and who are the uh, hosts of the Pete and, and Gary Gary's Military, military podcast. podcast. So please check that out as long as you're not doing it between, you know, 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. Eastern oh, time Sundays. on Sundays. You have the whole rest <laughs> of the week to check out pete and gary's military podcast and if you you know if you listen to enough of them you know you you, you honestly you probably don't have to buy the book but if you listen to a few of them then you can buy the book to get the rest of the story so works either way right and here's my takeaway chaps we'll we'll now be drinking on ours pete yeah uh, i think it's a good I plan know. gentlemen i think i i assumed from listening that you already were <laughs> 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 Peter Hart and Gary Bade, thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks. All right, I cut off Gary. Sorry about that, Gary. He's probably gonna. Uh, yeah, I was that it. Right it. Yeah, that's too bad. Uh, so awesome, great show. And next week, Chris, we have another live episode. Uh, Not a lot of humor next week. No, we are talking to Peter no. Wilson, who is the head of the Military History Department at Oxford University. There's a title. Uh, about his new book, Iron and Blood, A Military History of the German-Speaking People Since 1500. I think a nice light read, I imagine. Uh, <laughs> you know, haven't uh, gotten a look yet. Well, they've Actually, only been, you know, it's they've only been in one or two fights. So I, I, this is the this is the book for next week. That's how far. <laughs> <laughs> That's how far but I've gotten on. so far. So, but we're looking very much looking and forward. I just to that. want to, as I'm reading that now, all 800 pages of it, I'm going to keep thinking gut mittens every time it gets slow. On it. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good plan. Good plan. <laughs> um, uh, please subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook. Shout at us on Twitter. Listen to our podcast. Back us on Patreon That's and check better. out old episodes on our website, historyhappyhour.com. That should be enough to occupy you for the whole week. And then we'll see you next Sunday. Keep living. Keep learning. Thanks, everybody. Be safe.